Hey, good morning, guys. Welcome back to Drive Time. As always, I'm David Drum. And here with me today is actually one of my classmates from school. As a lot of you know, I'm at Southeastern University doing a graduate program. Uh, and joining us from the far off land of Tallahassee, Florida, is Sean Brantley. Um, now, the thing I want to tell you about Sean is, man, he's legit. He's the real deal. He uh, grew up in Central Florida, joined the Marine Corps, served honorably for five years, went into law enforcement for about 13 years. And now that he's stepped away from law enforcement, he actually acts as a veteran service counselor fighting for the rights of veterans, other veterans, to get them the care that they need. Um, and so, like, as you're hearing all this, hopefully you're picturing this, like, awesome stoic dude who like does no wrong and fights for the underdog. Um, and, and Sean, that's it. That's exactly what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting for the underdog, you know, <laughs> I'm not the whole stoic thing, but you know, but Hey, at least the beard's legit. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it, man. It's a labor of love. So, all right. Now I, I intentionally kind of gave you this nice glowing review and, um, uh, because you and I have already kind of discussed your story a little bit. Um, so in the, in the midst of your, your different careers and in the midst of what really should have been a, a life about serving other people, there's a, there's kind of a, a scribbled line on the, on the paper, right? Yeah. Yeah. So to, to say the least, um, I'll kind of walk you through, you know, kind of mini testimony here up until that point. Uh, like said, you said, I grew up in central Florida, um, you know, extremely rebellious, just monstrous kid, stayed in trouble with the law, um, just stayed in trouble in general. I mean, cops probably still know my name down there. It was terrible. So I, uh, I moved away from there in like 97, I think. And I came up to North Florida. My dad lives up here and, live with him to kind of get away from the chaos a little bit. Uh, met my, my wife, at, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, met her, um, kind of kicked around a little bit and then decided to go into core, uh, went to core. That was a, a life changer as far as growing up. I went in a little later. I was like 24 when I went in and, uh, you know, funny thing is the only reason I really wanted to go in is just so I could stack bodies. Like that was my mentality. And, um, so I went in there, uh, I call them God moments, but, I was a crew chief for Huey's and some God moments. Like I didn't get to go to Iraq with the rest of them to do my thing. So, you know, fast forward 2006, I got out, uh, came back to North Florida, um, and got immediately in law enforcement on the correction side. Um, you know, rolling through there, uh, and got on at the sheriff's department up here. And I mean, it just became, a life of, of goal setting and career driven and just wanted to do everything that I possibly could in my career and, uh, sacrifice for my family. Like, you know, I just was always work and work related and that's all I wanted to do. Well, you know, I got promoted to a Sergeant and, um, during that time, you know, uh, because I was just so selfish and inflated or whatever, I, uh, just fell down the devil's loophole and, and started a, a three year adulterous affair with a, co a coworker. Um, and it, it was, you know, I was just blinded in my life at that time. You know, I thought I was, I was doing this, this great thing. In the meantime, it was destroying my body, destroying my mind, destroying my family life. My wife had an idea, well, and towards the end of that, it got to the point where I'll just, I, I didn't want to be in it anymore, but I was too much basically of a coward, um, to get out of it myself. Well, you know, supernatural intervention there, I guess, uh, she found out way of a Facebook messenger, which was a terrible way to find out. Well, once, uh, you know, total repentance came and, and, uh, you know, I laid everything out on the line, you know, it was, I just started realizing like what a terrible human being I was, you know, what I've become. And, um, you know, I had a, I call it my Damascus road moment. Like I started just feeling like, man, this, this, this sucks, man, that I've done this to my family. Well, I'm in the shower one night, strangely enough. And it was like the, I mean, I, Jesus didn't appear to me in a blinding light or anything, but my scales did fall off. I mean, it was all at once. I felt this dump kind of like an adrenaline dump, you know, when you're dealing with somebody in law enforcement, but it was a dump to where every terrible thing that I've done in my life almost just came pouring down on me all at one time. 
And I realized like what a just uh, disgusting individual I'd become. And I didn't, I didn't want that life anymore. So the first thing I did was I got out of the shower and I, uh, I gathered my family in the living room and I just wept uncontrollably. And all I could do was just apologize. I mean, and say, I was sorry, like over and over and over again. And, you know, that started, I mean, that started my journey. I was like this, this time it's for real. You know, I, I can't, you know, God's given me another chance. You know, he reached down and plucked me from the pits of hell. So, you know, I, I got to meet the standard for my family for, you know, whatever. And what was crazy is growing up down in Bartow, um, you know, I ran with a pretty rough crowd. Um, and, but there was, there was probably, I would say four or five people that once I had that Damascus road moment, like the first person I reached out to was my youth pastor from down there, a guy named Mike Tedder. He's a pastor at Tabernacle. I think it's called in Atlanta now. So he's all the only person I knew to reach out to because I wasn't connected with any church or any Christians or anything. So I told him, I was like, Mike, man, this is what I've done. What can I do? Da, da, da. He kind of walked me through some things. And, you know, as I started listening to his sermons a lot, you know, me and my wife, and, you know, as we're trying to heal from this. And just during that time, I can remember those people who, you know, poured life into me. There's a guy named Josh Cotton Gim. I mean, this guy, I would, I would, I would lose my life for him just because of the, the good dude he is. Um, and then another sister is a, a girl named Vicki Howe that I grew up with. And when I say rough crowd, that's unless guys know us, that's a, that's an understatement. And she was, she walked along the whole time with us, but she was a Christian. Like she didn't do any of the things we did. She didn't get into the insanity. And you know, I can remember that like, and now understand as walking as a Christian, how hard that must have been being in that environment time after time. And then uh, the other one was uh, my mom. I mean, she was just an intercessory prayer warrior. And I thought she was super weird because she would put like these prayer cloths with anointing oil up in between my mattress. And, you know, and I, she used to steal my water bongs from me. And I mean, it was just, I mean, it was, we battled all the time. Uh, me and my friends had a joke. She would, um, we'd be getting ready to go out party knowing we're going to do something that's stupid that night. And the last thing she'd say to us as we're walking out of the door is remember, uh, Jesus is in the car with you. And at the time it pissed me off, you know, but looking back now, it's like, maybe if I didn't have that in my life, then I wouldn't have been able to recover, you know, how I am, how I'm getting to now. So I remembered all those lessons going through and, I started my walk for Christ, like through that. So, I mean, obviously there's, there's a, a, a ton of emotion and, and real life that you compressed into just a couple minutes of the story. So I, I want to, I want to highlight some stuff and, and ask you some questions um, okay. because you, you talked about how, I mean, how many years are you talking from the time these people were pouring life into you in your youth to, to that, that evening in the shower where you just broke down and had your Damascus road, uh, road moment. How many wow. you you're thinking, I'm thinking like, I would say as early as 90, 1990. Well, my mom is all, she's always, but I mean, I didn't really hit my, like supreme level in, of insanity until like high school and out. And, you know, during that time, strangely enough, the way I even met Mike Tedder, my mom went to the church and drug me along sometimes, but I'd gotten in trouble with the law and uh, they had a Christmas tree lot. So I had to do community service hours and he was the guy that was running it. So like during that time, I, you know, I couldn't get away from him. So it was like, and he didn't really push the religion down my throat. You know, it was just that constant example of, you know, when he greeted me, you know, cause you know, other people in the community, because I was such a knucklehead, man, it wasn't like that. You know, he was different. And the guy, Josh Cotton, given that I met, he had gotten in some trouble previous and he was at the Christmas tree lot doing community service hours. So, and he had given his heart to Christ. And, um, so those two like just kind of poured into me and, you know, I was still just being stupid. I mean, being stupid during that time. So you're not talking like, Oh, a year ago, these guys were pouring into my life. 
this is a substantial time frame has passed from mm-hmm. them trying to pour into you. And you have in that moment where you're like, man, I, I need to reach out to this guy. Like I, I, because like you said, you didn't have a local church community to, to then engage with you. You had to seek out a guy who had poured into you years before. Yeah. Um, and see, Mike had, had kept in touch with me over the years. Like, uh, I mean, he met me for lunch one time when I was living up here and just, you know, here and there contact or whatever. And, uh, and every time he, he met with me or I talked to him, um, there was never any kind of judgment or whatever. And, you know, my mom is really the, the main deciding factor in all that because she kept like me in contact with him. She's like, Hey, Mike's coming up. Mike's doing this. Mike's doing that. And really she was the one that kind of pushed me to choose Southeastern for my master's program. Cause I was going to law enforcement track. I had a, a bachelor's in, um, criminal justice. I was going to get a master's in something like that. But she, when I, I was in high school, she used to uh, have Southeastern kids over at the house in the living room and they'd sit around and play the guitar and do Bible studies. I always thought it was weird, but like, I can look back on that now and be like, wow, you know, my mom was in the grind, like way back then trying to save kids and helping kids. And meanwhile, her own son is just, you know, the devil spawn. So, you know, it was, just guys like Mike Tedder and like Josh Cotton being, I'd talk to him from time to time. And he, he struggled, you know, down some crazy roads himself. But to me, and I want to break off on this because this story right here is one that is, I tell everybody and it is stuck with me, you know, about what Christianity and discipleship is, is he got me a job cutting grass at one point with him down there. And we're cutting this huge complex or whatever. And, uh, this truck driver stops on the side of the road. So I see, you know, I call him cotton cotton goes over to him and is talking to him. Well, I make a pass around this big retention pond. Next thing I know, cotton's got this guy on his knees of the grass. Leading this guy to Christ. And it blew my mind. Cause I mean, now, like I said, walking with Christ the way I am and just that boldness is something that I just, I pray for. And I know, again, those examples are what like sustained me in my early walk. And that's crazy. So the, the thing that I, I really want to like kind of highlight for the guys watching this video is, you know, I think it's easy for us to, you know, we invite somebody to church that we work with, or we bump into somebody and we invite them to, you know, a men's breakfast or, or we, you know, talk to somebody or text them. We're like, Oh, you should come to church with us. <clears throat> and maybe they say no, or maybe they just kind of brush it off. Um, you know, we don't, we don't know how long God's going to let that seed sit. And we don't know which one of those guys years later is going to be at a rock bottom moment. And, and the only one they know to call is that guy who kept saying, Hey, come to church with me. Hey, you you know, you're welcome to come, you know, you, you're welcome at this breakfast. You're welcome at this event. You're welcome here. Or let me talk to you about this thing. And, and I think that's a, a, a huge encouragement for the guys like, you know, your friend there that you're talking about. Um, you know, I got to imagine for, for as many instances as a truck driver getting down on his knees on the side of the road, there's times where somebody you know, just brushes them off or, or, or doesn't respond the way he wants them to respond. But that obviously hasn't slowed him down. And, you know, again, who knows, maybe some of those people that, that brushed him off years later will, you know, greet him in heaven because of the seeds that he planted years and years before. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's important. I mean, and that's why I like, Cause it's easy as a believer to get discouraged. If like you invite a guy to church and you bring him in and he's there. And even if he gives his heart to Christ and then he just falls off, you're, you know, you're left thinking, man, did I not do enough? Did I say the wrong things that, you know, the devil starts working your mind, you know, and it's, it's really not up to us. You know, we're, we're to plant the seed. God may have somebody else water that seed, you know, and we may never know, but I mean, God's word is not going to fall void on anybody. I mean, even if, 
I mean, there's been times to where I've heard stories of people just having a bad day and somebody's come in and just been really kind to them and, you know, just gave them a little verse or something. And it's like completely changed people's lives. It's like we have no idea, you know, what our ministry may look like. And even you don't even have to say anything to people sometimes just by people's example you know, that like I have a youth, a youth pastor, which he's planted a church up in Georgia now. I mean, his name, name is Zach and just his example of just how he was, he didn't really have to say anything. It was just that you could tell that something was different about him. You know, there's those Christians that you can be like, something's weird about that dude. I don't know what it is, but I want some of it. You know what I mean? So you mean, you never know what, seed you plant could turn into a slap garden later, you know, because through what's crazy is, is through this, like, and I'm going to kind of branch off a little bit, but like, I was, I was still trying to work my job at that law enforcement agency after this thing came up. And after I gave my heart to Christ and I was like, Oh, I can do this. You know, that was that pride talk. And I can do it, you know, whatever, whatever. And my wife was like, you really need to leave there. She was having a problem with it, but I was like, you know, my mind frame was I've already destroyed my family enough. You know, I don't want to put them on the street or have them in some kind of financial burden because of a mistake I made. Well, she finally talked me into going on FMLA and I did, you know, well, I learned later on some of the things, how the Holy spirit speaks to you, but I kept getting like weird emails about veteran stuff that I've never gotten before coming in contact with people talking about veterans, working with homeless veterans when I'm on FMLA. So as I'm online one day looking around, I find this uh, veteran service counselor job. Didn't meet any of the qualifications. You needed a degree at the time, and I wasn't done with mine. Uh, had no idea what they did, and that was one of the requirements. So, you know, my wife was like, just do it. If God wants you that door to be open, then it'll open. So I went there to the interview, and I was honest with them. I was like, look, man, I don't even know what you guys do. You know, I laid out my classifications in this training that I had, and, like, the director jumped all over it. He was like, you know, we need this guy. So... I got the job, strangely enough, and it was a direct pay cut down the middle from where I was working. But my wife was an encouragement back then, you know, even when she was walking through what she was walking through, you know, she was like, God's going to provide. So that kind of boosted me. Well, through this job, I led one guy to Christ in my office with the door closed, uh, shared Christ with many others. I'm just like, I don't care. I'll share Jesus with anybody in there. And my director doesn't mess with me about it because it's a government job. So it's, you know, you got to be careful about stuff like that. But also through this, you know, destruction, how God has just brought good out of it. You know, my son came to Christ. My wife came to Christ. Um, I personally got to lead my daughter to Christ. And I mean, just many others that we've served. It's like, it's just this, you know, this craziness now. And then my son's fiance, she's, she's walking with Christ. You know, it's, it's, it's been a roller coaster of just wowness from all of that. You know what I mean? So now before we, we started the video, you and I were talking and you, you had talked about how, you know, as you and your wife are still kind of processing the hurt, um, from, you know, such a, 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 a big, uh, issue in your relationship. Um, you, you talked specifically about scripture and, and I, I want you to kind of talk about that because that, that's really important what you said. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're, especially like I call it dabbling is what I did when I was a youth coming up, you know, you read the Bible every once in a while, or you get your theology from a, a meme or well, back then there wasn't memes, but like a poster or something. So you thought you knew what was going on. Well, you know, and when, and Corinthians and Paul's like, love is patient, love is kind, things like that. You know, I always had this mindset of like, man, that's insanity. Nobody but Jesus can, can live up to that kind of love. Cause you know, that's just, I mean, I knew me, I knew guys I, I hung around with. Well, And that was actually through Southeastern, I had to do um, the uh, biblical preaching methods class and which caught me off guard. I had to actually do a sermon. So, well, through that, doing that sermon to prepare, I had to go in and like really research scripture and use commentary to see where it's coming from. Well, you know, just from learning that I I, I read through and, and Corinthians when in that verse, and I really realized at the time that, it's talking about agape love, which is something completely different than the love that we, 
you know, get falsely from movies or love songs or, you know, these, these gushy Hallmark movies or whatever. I mean, this is like a, a testament of will basically, like I'm going to love you no matter what you do. And Jesus was that perfect example. I mean, it, it was insane that if anybody's familiar with how the Romans used to torture the guys for the crucifixion and all that, what he went through, the beatings that he took. And I heard a guy talking the other day that like most men didn't live through the, uh, is actually a Ryan Reese podcast. Um, most men didn't live through the Roman beatings. So here Jesus was getting beat, getting ridiculed. I mean, he could have ended it like that. You know, army of angels could have came down and wrecked house, you know, uh, went and died on the cross. And, and what does Jesus say? Forgive them for they know not what they do. It's hard for me to forgive sometimes if somebody pulls out in front of me and almost makes me wreck, you know? So I can't, I mean, that's just putting it lightly. So when I realized like what agape love is, it completely changed how I approached my wife, how I approach relationships, which man, I still fail because I'm a creature. I have it. I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm still got that little monster inside of me that just wants to rebel to everything. So, but I mean, it's just changed things. And it's amazing because we have, like I said, we have that example in Christ, but it's those times when the wife and I are fighting and we say something stupid to each other. You know, it's, I can like kind of let that go. You know, I'm like, I'm going to love her no matter what. You know, I'm going to love this person no matter what they do to me. And through that, it's also helped me sharing people with sharing Christ with people because no matter what reaction I get from them, I'm like, Jesus found that person worthy enough to die for, you know? So it, it has changed everything. Well, I mean, that, and that's incredible. Um, and, and what a, a, a solid testament to why we need to be in the word and why we need to study the Bible. Um, because there there's life changing wisdom there, uh, not just, you know, feel good verses, but stuff that challenges and changes us. So, um, like you and I had talked about before, you know, the, the whole, point of our drive time videos is, is we try to help guys get better and, and improve. And, and, and we like to walk away with a, a tangible thing. So from, from your story, I mean, I feel like we could, we could pull so many things out. Um, but what is, you know, for a guy waking up tomorrow morning and, you know, um, or today on their way to work, whatever it is, what's that, that tangible thing that you think, that guys can do this week to just start stepping into this life that you're, you're experiencing now. Um, first and foremost, man, as men, we have a lot of pride in general, even though we don't know, and you got to put that at the door and it's a, it's a daily constant surrendering and dying to self. Cause along the way, and I've learned some things like about lusting and things like that, you know, you can't open the door to any of that. You have to squash that. Like for instance, with some of my tip techniques are if I'm driving down the road and I see that there's a, a, somebody running up ahead and it even looks like a female, even if I have to change lanes, I'm going to the opposite end and I'm looking straight ahead. I don't, I don't even want to give myself that opportunity and like, never being in the, in a, a, a personal conversation close to close with nobody else around with another female. Um, I mean, all of those things you have to put into practice. Like it was, uh, one of the guys that kind of helped me out coming through, I listened to the unashamed podcast, uh, with a duck commander guy sometimes and Jace on there, he was talking about something that really like hit home. And he says, it's the second look. Like as humans, we're going to notice beauty. You're going to notice if a woman's beautiful or a man's handsome or whatever, but it's like, okay, you notice and you look away. It's that second look to where the problem starts. You know, if you're looking back to admire that beauty again, then that that's where you're going to get yourself in trouble. So it's, and the things that I had to do just to, to start off in my walk is, you know, I purged everything in my life that didn't have to do with Christ. I mean, secular music, um, I don't watch the news. I don't watch any movies with, with any of that stuff, with cursing, any of that. And it was a daily thing because I'm a huge Anchorman fan. And that was like my favorite movie. But like, I know I can't watch anything like that because I don't want to give the devil a foothold, you know? And in those times where 
say before, I would just give up the walk, you know, when I was, when I was young, because it got too hard. Well, you know, you got to grind it out. It, it's, it's going to suck. I mean, it's, they have this misconception, or at least I did that Christianity was sunshine and rainbows and it's not. Sometimes it's going to be downright miserable, but those are the times that you have to press into Christ and you have to make those sacrifices to, you know, to keep going on that walk. I mean, that's why pick up my, pick up your cross and follow me. That's not just sometimes that's a, a daily dying to self, you know, in every relationship you have, it's a daily dying to self. That's good. It's uh that is a challenge. Um, well, Sean, I, I want to say, you know, thank you on behalf of all the guys that are watching, um, for just being so open to share your story with us. And, and, uh, I thank you for, you know, using your past to, to hopefully keep maybe a, another guy from walking down that road and, 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 you know, their family having to experience the things that, that you've experienced, but also for, for giving us, you know, the encouragement out of it. So, so thank you for doing that. Um, thank you for, uh, you know, sharing your time here on uh, drive time and gentlemen, we'll see you again next week here on drive time.